Lovely. Um, so thank you so much for um, so many people uh, joining this evening. Um, shame we can't all be in the same room together, but never mind. Um, um, I'm a conservation project manager for um, ZSL. And for those of you that don't know ZSL, we're an international conservation charity with some 200 year history. And um, so we work all over the world, but I work in a team that's focused on the UK. So we've got eight people in our team. We're all aquatics and we work on estuaries and freshwater. And the kind of areas of main interest are on uh, ecosystem restoration. So we've got projects on restoration of oyster reefs. We do a lot of research on um, functional habitat for particular fish species or marine mammals um, and a lot of citizen science and water quality uh, type work and actually the project I'm going to be talking about this evening was the first essentially was our first foray into citizen science in um, in aquatics um, uh, so um, yeah okay I'll carry on um, the eel. So this is how we first see them uh, when they arrive in the tents. Um, so this is a delightful little um, glass eel um, photographed in March time at the mouth of the Wandel. So if you know your um, uh, uh, Thames geography, you'll know this is in the tidal section, pretty much in the middle of London. And um, they, uh, it's about 60 millimetres long or so, this lovely thing. It's unpigmented, so hence the name glass eel. And for many years, it was a great mystery as to where these things or how these little elvers, as they become, uh, how they arrive in huge numbers in the springtime. And we have um, this chap to thank um, for understanding or, or illuminating the great um, mysteries that existed uh, in the eel's biology. Um, and so what he did, this, this, this the chap on the slide is Johannes Schmidt, a Danish scientist who spent about 20 years gathering um, leptocephali, they're called, the larval eel. You can see them on the slide there. Um, he was gathering them from the surface waters of the Atlantic. And um, the numbers on the screen are obviously the lengths. And so a fairly simple bit of analysis shows him that uh, the smaller they were, uh, they were smaller, sorry, on the western side of the Atlantic, uh, and that that is uh, from, that's where they originate from. And all subsequent um, evidence has supported the amazing truth that the eel has this extraordinary marine uh, migration across the Atlantic. And there's 15 species or so of um, anguillid eel. And uh, they all display these oceanic migrations. The European eel actually has the biggest, but um, they all do the same sort of thing. And it's not that uncommon for marine fish to, to um, uh, for their young to grow up in estuaries, um, and in some cases freshwater, of course, but this is probably the most uh, extreme example of that um, kind of uh, life cycle. So we have Johannes Schmidt to thank for um, illuminating the amazing truth of the European eel. But um, thankfully, I think really, because it's the sort of nature of this iconic species that some mysteries still remain and I shall touch on them uh, later. I should have said I plan to speak for about half an hour or so and then, and then open up to questions if you have any. Um, but of course, the reason why we're working on eel is because of um, what's going on uh, with the species. So if you're familiar with the story of the eel, you'll be familiar with this um, slide showing the decline in recruitment. Um, as you're all um, expert ecologists, you'll know that recruitment in this case refers to the number of young joining the adult population. And um, on the y-axis here, that's logarithmic. So um, the, the decline is actually more dramatic than that gentle slope suggests. And we're, so we're now at about less than 10% uh, of re uh, recruitment levels prior to, to the 1980s. 
So really, um, crash is the word that applies to this, really. And what happens now is that um, uh, ICES, this, you can see the, the acronym there on the chart, ICES stands for the International Council for Exploration of the Sea, and it's a kind of intergovernmental um, marine organization. They, they uh, collate um, time series data from all over the European Eels range. So that's all the way from North Africa up into Scandinavia every year. Um, and uh, a group of scientists who, who, who call themselves the Working Group on European Eel gather, uh, the gathering of the, of the wise folk, and uh, they offer um, management advice for the, for the European Eel. So that's the way it works now. And I'm going to be I'm going to be talking really about a very local project. You know, we're talking about work, practical conservation work um, within the Thames region. But obviously, the the eel story uh, is uh, geographically very wide. They're, they're they're politically important. What I mean by that is people's livelihoods are dependent upon them. So it's a sort of complicated picture for eel and I and I sort of feel if we can get it right for eel we can crack not that any species is easy but uh, other things surely are possibly easier than a species that migrates has such a complicated um, um, life cycle and I should point out I meant to point this out at the beginning actually but suddenly felt slightly flustered that um, uh, ZSL is quite eel heavy so um, we've got some um, chair of the Anguillid eel specialist group who works with us and we've also got eel researchers who work, um, or researchers of eel and other fish, who work at the Institute of Zoology, which is where all the evidence is generated to underpin the conservation action. So I work in the, the kind of practical welly boots department, conservation and policy, where we, where we put conservation programs together based on the evidence generated by the scientists in the Institute of Zoology. So anyway, so the evidence of decline is clear, and that means obviously that the um, the eel is now designated uh, uh, in a number of ways, and probably the most important is the fact that it's listed as critically endangered on the IUCN's red list, and that happened in 2008. And from there, we've got uh, European Union eel regulations, uh, which were developed in 2009. And what they mean is that each member state has to develop eel recovery plans. Um, and we very much work within that framework, the eel recovery plan, obviously the eel management plan rather for the Thames uh, River Basin District. Uh, they are appendix two in CITES, Convention of International Trade and Endangered Species. So it's not um, banned, but regulated. Uh, which is ex itself extraordinary given they are a critically endangered animal. Um, and they're also appendix two in the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species, Wild Animals. So lots of action, lots of research, uh, a lot of literature out there on them, and particularly a lot of literature around wider decline. And in truth, it's it's probably, a, a, as it always is, a combination of many factors. And I can recommend, if you want to read more about this, have a look at, this is again one of our colleagues, David Jacobi, and a number of other authors, including others from ZSL, wrote a very good paper published in 2015. You can see it's listed there, the synergistic patterns of threat and challenges facing global anguillid eel conservation. So uh, they obviously deal with all eel species, but, um, the European eel specifically uh, um, problems in exploitation. So they are there is still a global trade in eel. Uh, they fetch a high price, and we're going to talk more about that in a bit. Uh, An introduced parasite, which of course, because they are globally traded, humans have, have moved, uh, have allowed parasites or disease to transfer from one species to another. Climate change and its impact on surface water currents um, in the Atlantic. You know, if you think their life cycle is geared around the oceanic gyre in the North Atlantic, then you'll realize that it's susceptible to changes in those currents. And pollution, particularly around uh, persistent organic pollutants building up in 
fatty tissues. If you have to swim back to the Sargasso Sea, it's not helpful if you've got a, uh, a body full of pollutants. Um, in fresh water, um, it's, it's more, these are more the issues, or certainly the issues listed in the eel management plan. You know, historically, we have a, a, a legacy of draining and degrading freshwater habitats. In fact, recently, the Living Planets Index showed that 90% of freshwater uh, wetlands across the world are, are, are degraded, um, and freshwater species seem to be the, the, the most impacted across the world, fastest declining. Um, Spe specifically listed in the eel management plan, uh, so that's the e Environment Agency's management plan, produced as a result of the eel regulations. There are barriers to migration, and all those dots on that map of the Thames region, uh, each dot is a barrier, so there's over 2,400 in the Thames alone, and that gives you an impression of the scale of the issue facing migratory species. And entrainment, and what I mean by that is eels being drawn into um, pumps um, and chopped up. So uh, in turn, I'll just briefly mention um, what's being done about entrainment. Well, this is part of a national program led by the Environment Agency to ask water companies to screen their pumps. Um, and this is what a screen looks like on the Thames. They're great big things. Of course, you need a very large surface area to deal with the volumes and the flows uh, that the pumps are drawing through. Uh, and in, in, in the Thames alone, Thames Water have spent in the region of £30 million pounds to screen their pumps. And it's obviously not just beneficial for eel, but for other species too. And our, our work in the Thames is much more to do with restoring those migratory pathways, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on our Thames um, project now. But just before I do, just give you a bit of information on um, the ecology of eels in fresh water. So essentially it's simple stuff really. They're moving from high density, so they arrive in very high density, to areas of lower density and that's a function of, you know, uh, sharing resource. So if at lower density each individual has more resources. Um, in the Thames, the migration of the, of the year ones, so the little elvers who just arrived from the ocean is about 30 kilometers from the tidal limit. That's about as far as they can get. Uh, and, and in fact, actually that's, that's correct for estuaries around uh, the UK. Um, they, um, what happens is uh, if they're blocked from accessing upstream habitat, they tend to accumulate uh, behind barriers and then you get what's called density dependent mortality so basically too many eels in in a small area causes the numbers to decline and um, you know they're famous for being able to climb and move out onto wetted grass and things but that ability to climb does does decline as they get longer um, so the smaller ones can climb up wetted vertical surfaces but they lose that ability so if you want to improve their ability to move up over barriers, you need to put in little eel passes. Uh, well, not, not always little, actually, um, sometimes quite large. Um, but they're essentially channels uh, with water flowing over a media that allow the eels to crawl through. Um, so they, they, they pass from the, the, the downstream riverbed up and over the crest of a, of a weir or a sluice up to the upstream side. So relatively simple and nice and maintenance free, um, which is great. And what we do in the Thames area is we take the opportunity to monitor uh, the eel passes in the area. And this, these, I don't know whether you can actually make out these, these schematics. They're not actually that helpful, I don't think, looking at them now. But um, essentially the designs are the same, although we use different um, traps in, in different passes and sometimes we use pumps although having done that for a few years now we realize that that um, that is difficult and challenging and often pumps break so we would rather not be doing that um, the best ones are just simple gravity fed passes that the eels crawl up and they drop into a, a tank or a trap and then they wait there for our um, volunteers to come and um, release them upstream, count them and measure them, which is what, what they do. And I'll talk about that shortly. But this is not the only way to monitor 
eels. Um, you can do it in a number of other ways. So um, lots of people have had success using these habitat traps, which look like a kind of mop, that thing with the yellow boy attached to it. It's essentially a mop of kind of toughened netting and things. And the little eels, the, the elbows uh, hide in that and you can just pull them out and then count them. Of course, that's just giving you relative trends over time, if you're doing you know, basic ecological study, you're doing the same thing year on year, uh, and you can get trends in numbers, which is essentially what we're doing as well, but perhaps slightly more sophisticated. Um, the Environment Agency monitoring uses electric fishing. So they do for eels, uh, which are slightly more resilient to uh, electricity in the water, they do specific uh, protocol, they pass five times over a set area of a river and they catch the eels and record what's in there and they go back to the same location each time again to get trends. And you can use fight nets as well, which are a kind of elongated net and the eels move down into the end of them uh, and get stuck. Um, so obviously all these, any trapping of animals, you know, the, the welfare of the animal is paramount and also if, in, our, in the case of our study, we're um, including volunteers. So the welfare of the volunteers is also important, uh, or more than important, essential. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear if you join us. Um, and so what we do every, every year about April time, well, in April time, we offer training. So look out for the giant flashlight in the sky. And remarkably, when we first started doing this, we had no idea how many people were gonna join us um, and uh, we actually get about 120 volunteers each year uh, uh, coming to monitor traps um, um, and release the eels and record the data with us. So the way it works with each trap um, is that there's three organisations involved, essentially. So there's us, we, we uh, run the trainings and we produce the monitoring protocols and the online data transfer system and a bit of data processing behind the scenes. Um, the site partner, so what I mean by that, they are, off, are often wildlife trusts or rivers trusts, uh, various other friends of groups that we work with around uh, Greater London. And then as I mentioned before, the environment agency. So you have to get licensed to, to trap eel. So we have licenses for all our traps. And they also, of course, provide strategic advice and support. And that, again, is through the EU management plan process. So it's all linked, it's all joined up. And um, as, of course, with all citizen science um, projects, the joy of it, um, the strength, is that you can get so much data from such a big area that you couldn't really feasibly do um, uh, through a staff, you know, you, working with um, just staff monitoring traps. So since 2011, when we first started working with citizen scientists, we've monitored uh, at 18 sites in the Thames region. And uh, any, for any given year, the most tr uh, traps we've had running is 15. So essentially we have a kind of rolling program and we have three what we call index sites. Um, which we want to get long-term data from. And then for, from all the other sites, we want to have at least three years. That's enough information from that one site, from those sites. And then we want to move on, essentially starting low down in river catchments and then moving up. That's the plan anyway. Um, so I'm just gonna spend a few moments to tell you about what we get from the data that we gather this way from the citizen scientists who come and join us and, and count and measure reels with us. Uh, so firstly, it's that recruitment information, which I mentioned at the beginning is so important. You know, you, you don't know what's happening. I mean, it goes without saying really with a population of animals, if you don't know how many young uh, are joining the adult population, you know, you don't know whether the population is expanding or declining. So recruitment is that essential first bit of information and uh, we've been monitoring on the River Roding, which is East London, uh, north side for 15 years now. So that's our longest data set. And what I've done, what we've done with this chart here is we've, we've shown our, uh, our catches from the Roding in the blue columns against the gray and uh, orangey brownie, whatever that is, lines of that ICES data, you know, the working group on eel I mentioned. 
And the first thing to, to note is it's normal to get this annual variation. So variation across years is normal of recruitment. And also very interesting to note as well that our catches in the roading match what we're seeing across the North Sea. So you've got this background context that we always have to take into account when we're looking at the local variation in numbers arriving. And actually that data set now, because it's been going for 15 years, we actually send it in to ICs and it's used as supplementary evidence for them to, to, to issue their, their eel management advice as they do on an annual basis. So it's becoming an increasingly important data set. So the other sort of things we get, and this is, I think actually, this is the most fun really, I have to say, uh, from this project, it's getting the local stories. So things like, um, and I managed to, I've managed to suck out the fun, I have to say with this very boring uh, uh, slide showing just a, a, um, the chart showing 2013, 2011 to 13, we monitored on, monitored on the River Crane um, uh, uh, for real and didn't catch a single thing. It didn't seem to dampen the enthusiasm of the volunteers that joined us and checked the trap twice a week uh, during the spring and summer of those years. Um, and, and what they did provide for us, even though they didn't catch any eels, what they did provide for us was the evidence that we needed to show that there was a problem. In the, in the crane catchment in that eels couldn't pass from the main channel of the Thames up into the, into the catchment. So we built a pass um, that you can see it in the picture there, that silver tray has obviously got uh, the media, you all know this by now, it's got media inside with water flowing uh, over it and the eels can move up, it's remarkable. And then we trapped upstream again and sure enough, we start to see eels entering the crane sustainably so the, for the first time there's there, there's recruitment into the crane catchment and all that habitat that had formerly been uh, shut off to them was opened up by the addition of this pass um, up over the barrier at the confluence with the Thames so this wonderful local story which we really enjoyed sharing with those volunteers that help us helped us gather the information and again a similar thing on the cray it demonstrates the impact of intervention so um, on the River Cray, which is um, you know, sort of Bexley Way, um, uh, going into Kent, um, again, very low numbers of eels able to make it up. And this is a familiar story with, uh, uh, especially in sort of estuarine environments, you get these big um, sluice gates and barriers at the confluence with the river, uh, which of course uh, is the critical point and no eels can pass over them. So we, we, we built a couple of passes, the Environment Agency built passes, and then we start seeing the numbers coming up in our upstream, upstream trapping site. So, you know, quite a delightful rarity in this um, age of biodiversity crisis to have these local success stories. So I just wanted to make the point with this slide that it's really, you know, when we first started doing this, we were thinking, oh, we want data. We're going to get, we're going to work with volunteers who are going to give us all this lovely data. And sure enough, they do give us wonderful data. Uh, we certainly couldn't do it on ourselves by ourselves. But what we didn't really realize at the outset was the how that the citizen science project kind of provides the glue, if you like, between all the various stakeholders working within the eel management plan. Um, and, and so that's been a, a, an amazing benefit. So it, it's really a kind of central project providing data into the wider management plan for the species. And through the, the coalescing all the stakeholders, we are able to feed that information back out to them. And then they're able to take their own action uh, for eel in their own river catchments, whether that be rivers trusts building their own passes or removing barriers or whatever. So, um, I think it's 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 been illuminate, illuminating for us anyway that additional benefit of bringing citizen science into our work. Obviously, there is a danger uh, of getting interested in in in, um, in eels because they are mesmerizingly wonderful. Their their life story is is still full of mystery. I'm pleased to say, uh, and full of intrigue. And each eel you catch in a trap it's just a wondrous thing to think it's traveled uh, over the Atlantic so with with a few of our our volunteers what does happen is they undergo this very 
um, unusual um, metamorphosis themselves and end up completely obsessed with eels. And um, uh, sometimes it starts with a fairly innocuous reading of this wonderful book. I don't know whether you can see that. The Book of Eels by Tom Fort. I thoroughly recommend it. It's a great sort of grounding uh, in the biology of eels. But do be warned, it is a slippery slope and uh, you might start metamorphosing. So anyway, enough of that. Um, so really our focus now um, for the Thames project is really on restoring migratory pathways. So, um, and again, we rely on Environment Agency electric fishing data to point out within catchments where, and our own data, sorry, point out in catchments where barriers seem to be impacting eel populations. And then we, we build passes and uh, 104 passes or so have been built in the Thames uh, River Basin District, the Thames region since 2005. 36 of those have, have been through our, our, our project, which has improved access to nearly 140 kilometers of habitat for critically endangered eels. So as I pointed out at the beginning, you know, it's a regional project on a, a, for an animal that has a much bigger uh, story attached to it, but nonetheless, um, it's an important one. And we're very pleased that some of the lessons that we've learned and some of the methods that we've been using in the Thames have traveled elsewhere across the UK. One interesting thing that we didn't anticipate at the outset was actually that um, uh, in this in modern, modern age, um, we're still lacking some basic information and namely that's where the barriers are uh, and, and what the impact of the barriers are on, uh, on fish species. So what we've done is um, uh, we've created uh, the imaginatively titled A Field Guide to Assessing the Passability of Man-Made River Structures by European Eels. And this, is, this guide is, is, is designed to be a sort of bankside way of assessing the passability of a weir or a dam or whatever uh, to eels. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that's been in use by Rivers Trust and it's got endorsement from the Environment Agency and things and we, we're keen for others uh, to use it and to give us feedback on it. And um, an interesting project that's going on in the Thames region is trying to pull together data on, on barriers. It's called the Fish Roadmap Project and um, we work within that to try and get more information on uh, where the barriers are because without that's the basic isn't it we need to know where the barriers are in order to prioritize interventions and to that end as well we've we're, we're, we're involved in a reboot of a, of a what's called a river obstacles app so if you're ever walking a river and you spot a weir uh, do not hesitate to reach for your smartphone and upload the uh, a picture of it onto the river obstacles app please that would be very helpful indeed um, so this is what it looks like now in the Thames. So um, uh, these dots, this is an environment, this is environment agency data. These, these dots are where the, the, the black and the green are where electric fishing uh, surveys have taken place and the green being where eels have been found. And you can see there's some little outliers right in the top of the catchment, which are probably, that's probably a remnant of introduced eels. Um, you know, they're stopped basically. And so what's actually happened is that eels have kind of uh, retrenched to a more southerly central section of the, the, the Thames. And we don't really know whether this is a, the impact of uh, the barriers or uh, stopping migration or the impact of the reduced recruitment into the Thames. And so really this, um, you know, with the Environment Agency and all the partners that we're working with, it's a kind of real world, uh, experimental approach you know we're building passes we're reviewing the data and seeing what impact we have uh, so very exciting to be part of it and we have the opportunity every year to relay what we're doing to our um, volunteers that join us at our at our eel forum that we hold annually at um, ZSL oh sorry I might be waffling on a bit much but anyway the final uh, journey back is um, this, uh, the, the eels mature into uh, silver eels. So the, the belly goes silver, the eye enlarges ready for the journey back uh, to the ocean. And, um, you know, this is probably the, the, one of the biggest mysteries r remaining about uh, the European eel is whether they are panmixic. So what panmixic, that means random mating 
So can an eel, a silver eel from Spain mate with a silver eel from, from uh, the UK, uh, which is what panmixia is, sort of random mating, or do they show phylopatry? So you're going back to specific locations. And there's a tantalizing bit of evidence in the, um, the well, I should say the received wisdom is that it's panmictic, panmictic, so just random. Uh, but there's a tantalizing bit of evidence to suggest that perhaps not, because Icelandic eels show hybridization between the European and the American eel, and we don't really see hybrids in Europe. And, and yet in Icelandic eels, the hybrids, hybridization goes back over a number of generations sometimes. So it suggests that they're kind of speciating or that they have a distinct spawning ground. So interesting and tantalizing and full of mystery still, which is wonderful. Uh, just a few last things that I want to mention. Um, uh, the things that we really need to get to, to, to grips with are um, uh, aligning all our estuaries around the, Q, around the UK, our flood defense structures. Um, and of course they are essential and important in protecting kind of in, infrastructure, important infrastructure but they're not very clever at allowing fish to migrate. And we do have the technology now to allow fish to move through these tidal flaps and as you can see in the picture, they're just, we're slow on installing them. Uh, and they do cut off a lot of important wetland and marshy habitat that's so good uh, for eel. And we know that we know it's good because we've done some studies on it. Um, also a big problem related to CITES. So I mentioned that uh, regulate, uh, Trade in eel is regulated through CITES, and actually it was um, exporting eel from Europe was banned and immediately this set up an illegal trade. And two years ago, it was estimated by Europol that a hundred tons of glass eel uh, was illegally shipped out, or maybe even last year. So that's an estimated 350 million bill of glass eel shipped out into markets uh, elsewhere in the world. And, and the incentives are high. A BBC reporter was offered a thousand pounds per kilo of glass eel, um, uh, illegally, of course, um, to, to ship them out. Um, and that was again last year. So uh, when we think of the illegal wildlife trade, we might think of big fluffy things elsewhere in the world, but no, it's happening right here, uh, sometimes in the UK, definitely in Europe. Um, you know, in terms of value and in terms of numbers of, of individuals, it's one of the biggest illegal wildlife crimes uh, on the planet. But I don't want to end with the doom. I want to end with a ray of hope. And so I want to let you know that in the ICs, the working, remember the wise elders who issue in, information on uh, eel populations, their report this year, so hot off the press, suggests that recruitment decline stopped in 2011 and they don't leap for joy and say it's definitely on the way up but they do say the trend is unclear um, and others are more optimistic and say it's definitely coming up so reasons for optimism which is always important so um, I think I'm going to leave it there thank you so much for listening I'm sorry I might have got carried away as I always do with you those are some references which I'm going to which are going to go out with these slides. I think they should be available. And I just do need to say thank you so much to our wonderful volunteers that join us. Some of them might be listening this evening. Uh, we, we literally couldn't do this work without them. We're funded through the City Bridge Trust, Disney Conservation Fund, and Thames Water at the moment. And we're very grateful to them. And also included on the last slide, which I should have mentioned, is a link through to our Get Involved page. So if you if you care to come and join us, you can sign up uh, to our, our email list and you'll get about six emails a year or so, no more, uh, telling you different training events for the EEL project and various other projects that we run across the region. So thanks again for listening and I hope there's a few questions if I haven't run out of time. That was brilliant, thank you Joe. And yes, you do have time for questions and I've had lots of them already. Um, if anyone else has got any questions, I can see loads coming in in the chat now, right? Okay, I'm going to dive straight into it. Um, just a reminder for everyone as well, there is also the option to put up your virtual hand if you'd like to ask any questions. So again, you can do that by clicking on participants and then there should be an option there somewhere. Right, I 
better get started to try and get through these. Uh, we've had a couple of questions, Joe. People just asking, how long do the eels live for? Oh, basic information I should have given out. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's temperature dependence, as with many um, aquatic organisms, it's dependent on the environment, the amount of food and the temperature. So um, in colder countries, they live, they'd spend a lot longer in freshwater, 20, 30 years up northern European countries, much shorter time in Spain, for instance, four or five years. In the UK, about 15 years to, mat to mature, that sort of length of time. Wow, thank you. Um, Stephen was asking, how deep do the marine larvae tend to live? And do they also uh, do a daily vertical migration? Nice question. Well, they don't. They seem to be drifting surface, surface waters. Uh, the, the diurnal migration um, uh, is definitely displayed by the adults traveling back. So not only are they traveling 4,000 kilometers um, back to the Sargasso, but they're doing it by doing this swimming as deep, I think, as about 200 meters uh, uh, diurnally. In fact, if you want more information on that, there's an amazing, um, oh, I've just spotted Anna. I used to work with. Hello, Anna. Um, uh, yeah, there's an amazing project called the Iliad, brilliantly titled, run by CFAS, um, which tracked eels going back to the Sargasso, and they were the ones that discovered this amazing diurnal uh, migration, depth-wise. Great, thank you. Um, Izzy was asking, does glass eel refer to a development stage of the eels? It does. So when they, what happens is when they um, um, arrive at the continental shelf, um, they, tr they metamorphose from that kind of willow leaf shape, the flattened leptocephali, the body goes round, uh, but they are unpigmented. And so that's the phase that we call glass eel. So about 60 millimetres long. When they get into fresh water, they pigment remarkably quickly. And then when they're pigmented, they are elva. Great. Thank you. Uh, Stephen was asking, how often do they reproduce during their lifespan? Once, it's a one way round trip. They, they, they swim to fresh water, grow up, swim back to the Sargasso and are not seen again. And, uh, but no one's seen them spawning or reproducing in the Sargasso. So the mystery remains. Great, thank you. Um, quite a few different people are asking if similar work is going on elsewhere on any other rivers in the UK. Yeah, there's, there's, there's um, monitoring sites um, in various regions of the UK. So if anyone's interested in, in taking part in a project like this, do contact your local rivers trust. Obviously, if you live in the Thames region, please come to us. We'd be delighted to welcome you. But if you live elsewhere, contact your local rivers trust. And if they're not monitoring eel, ask them why not. <laughs> we can come and help when we, 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 we can help them. It's, it, I mean, just having one monitoring site is helpful because again, thinking about that recruitment information, you know, if you, if you can set it up and run it for a few years, it's of great value. Thank you. Um, Anna, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask your question? Oh, we can't hear you. Hang can't on. Can't hear you. Oh, um, oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, you got me. Oh, I thought I'd show my face and say hi to Joe, um, who I used to work with, and uh, remember you showing up to the office with your um, kick net folded and attached to the back of your bike. I'm still doing the same thing, Anna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yes, I do have a question. Um, well, I've now relocated up to Scotland, so. Um, I don't know if you have monitoring sites up here in Scotland and if there's, um, I know we tend to have a focus on a different type of migratory fish, the salmonids, um, and we pay more attention to barriers to them. Um, are, the, are the barriers for eels and salmonids similar and the solutions the same or do we need to consider two different problems and two different solutions for those two types of fish? The, the, solu the technical solutions, the problems are the same. The technical solutions are very different. So obviously salmon, salmon is kind of a leap. Um, and actually, um, uh, 
if it wasn't for COVID, a, a, a new project was was starting up in Scotland. I, I, I've forgotten the chap that was, we, we, we were in um, April, there was going to be a kind of EO conference um, and the start of a new uh, monitoring project across Scottish rivers. Uh, but COVID has ruined our fun. But I can send you um, the, the link for that if you wish. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got a few people. Uh, Miriam and Joe have asked, what is electric fishing? How does it work? Is it dangerous? Um, uh, well, it, it's, it's, um, it, it works by passing a, a, a current through um, a river and that stuns fish. And so they, um, it's, it's not dangerous if done correctly. Um, and uh, uh, it's probably a little unpleasant if you're a fish, but the, after you're, uh, as a fish, after you're stunned, you, you come to the surface and then you're caught out uh, with a net and uh, environment agency folk will measure you and release you, identify your species, measure and release you. So that's electric fishing. And what they do is they net off the same section of river each year. So maybe 200 meters of the river and they pass through it uh, uh, a gang of, of, of EA staff will pass through it, catch the first lot, and then um, remove them, and then catch the next lot of fish. And it allows them to get very accurate sort of quantitative data on the number of fish, the biomass of fish in that stretch of river. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions about uh, predation as well. So what predates the eels? And do the passes allow for the concentration of elvers for predators as well? That's great. That's, thank you so much for your questions. They're great questions. Um, well, this is the, I mean, the, the, the kind of other side of the whole eel, allowing eels into all the, 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 the catchments that we're working on is we know they are a very important food source for all sorts of things. Um, you know, uh, kingfishers, obviously we don't have otters in Greater London, but otters, uh, other predatory birds, um, uh, predatory fish, the, these are that, that glut of elver that formerly would have arrived uh, would have been a great source of nourishment, um, enriching food webs in rivers. Uh, and that's why it's another important reason to, to allow them to, to move upstream. Um, um, what was the other part of the question? Sorry, I've got... Uh, um, so it's just about the passes as well. Does that sort of concentrate the elvis? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. They've always got, they've got lids. Uh, otherwise they do act a bit like a buffet. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, passes have lids, yeah. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got a couple of questions asking how far upstream will eels travel? Well, they'll distribute. It's really interesting. That until relatively recently, I suggest, maybe um, 15, 20 years ago, the kind of the idea was that it was a, quite a simple uh, migration. So they keep moving upstream and then they all head back. They head back in the autumn, by the way, they move, they move up in the spring and early summer, and then they head back in the autumn. But actually, the, the, it's much more complex, as you, as you would imagine, than being eels. So some of them move upstream and then quite quickly settle out and show fidelity to a particular location. Others, we don't know why, some settle out in the ocean, others will keep moving upstream. Essentially, they'll fill all available habitats uh, and they'll move randomly in, in different phases of their life and different eels display different behaviors. So it's complicated, basically. <laughs> Thank you. Jane is asking, do dogs or people bathing in the rivers have any impact on eel numbers? Um, not as, not, I, I can't imagine they would, no, no. Okay, Not that you. I'm aware of. <laughs> it's, it's just, sorry, can I, can I say? Yeah, go for it. It's just that um, we monitor at Morden Hall Park and we have a lot of dogs and children using the river in the summer. And I just wondered if that made any difference. I mean, 
not the Thames because that's rather too difficult for people and to get into. But you know, in Warnhall Park, we have quite a lot. That's what. Um, not well, seen. yeah, no, I, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I mean, certainly in urban areas, we want rivers to be accessible because with access and enjoyment comes value, and we nurture our environments more if they're if they're used in that way so it's a thing. Thing. um i tell you one one emerging issue um that with dogs is that um near nicotinoids and flea treat yeah exactly flea treatments yeah. yeah um and we don't know enough about that really that's that's for sure oh well we do know near nicotinoids are, are damaging but we don't know enough about about the the, the, the concentrations as a result of pet flea treatments and actually, we, we've got a, a piece of work starting soon, I hope, uh, on that very issue. So maybe we'll come and talk to you Good. at Morton Hall. Yes. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jane. Um, sorry, I'm just, okay, loads and loads of questions. So I don't think we're going to have time to get through them all. Sorry. Um, I'll just read through some now. Oh, so Jess is asking. Um, obviously, you can create pathways to help eels overcome barriers, but how do we help them overcome the obstacle of climate change? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, that's too big, isn't it? It's too big for this evening's talk. Um, we can all do our bit, can't we? We know what we have to do. Put an extra jumper on, he says in a T-shirt. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I can't tackle that one now, but yeah, good. Nicely put. Nicely put. Well, no worries. Thank you. Uh, Wiley was asking, does the uh, Thames European Eel Project cover the whole of the Thames all the way up to the source at Cricklade? Um, we are slowly moving catchment by catchment upstream. So um, it doesn't at the moment. Um, and, and that's partly because the whole uh, strategy was to start lower down on the confluences with the various catchments in order to gauge recruitment and then move upstream. So uh, in our sites next are the, are the catchments of the River Way. So we're still quite far downstream, really, the River Way, and then we'll move up from, from there. So no, sorry. Don't worry. Um, Keith is asking, uh, where are eels present across the UK and where are they not present? They're pretty much present in all water bodies with the exception of some sort of upland, small upland streams. It's remarkable. I, I, one of the joys of my job is I get every now and again, I sent, get sent pictures of eels in the most random places, which is absolutely wonderful. So they're, they're everywhere. Last year, after the floods, there were floods somewhere last year and I got pictures of uh, adult eels stuck in a bunker on a golf course. Um, because they just move, you know, they, they will, they are, the, the flooding is a, is a classic example. They will move on floods into new areas. So they get, they seem to get everywhere. Thank you. Uh, Jane is asking, is it legal to fish eels from the Thames? Yeah, remarkably, it, it, it still is. I mean, they are, there is a, there is a, a licensed fishery. I mean, this is the strange thing. They are a critically endangered animal and they get that critical, critically endangered uh, status because of the collapse, the recruitment collapse. So it's a kind of technical assessment, the IUCN red list. But in recognition, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a sort of balancing act. You know, they, 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 people's livelihoods were dependent on them. So there, were, there was a fishery before, there still is a fishery, but it's much diminished. So for instance, on the Thames is about 11 licenses given to catch adult eel. And I think as those license holders stop catching then they won't be renewing them, but yeah, it's still, it's still legal to catch, although regulated. Yeah, um, so Louisa had a question following on from that. Is there any legislation people can campaign for to help eels? Uh, legislation to, ca to campaign for? Well, the, the good thing about the, the, the eel management plans and the, the EU eel regs, of course, is that they've all, along with all the other regulations, they've been put into UK uh, law. Uh, yeah. Uh, and in fact, there's this, uh, there was already a before, uh, 
Brexit, there was a, a, a statutory instrument that was developed um, in the UK in response to the eel regulations, which obliged uh, owners of weirs and things to put passes over them, owners of abstraction points to screen the pumps. Um, I think the best thing to do is if you see examples of structures that aren't passed, or if you if you if you you know contact your local environment agency officers or contact your local rivers trusts and ask the question whether something needs to be done. That makes sense. Yeah. Or contact me. My email's on the on the on the slide, so I'll be happy to happy to receive pictures of eels in random places. <laughs> You should start a competition, shouldn't you? The strangest place that you found one. Oh, man, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Joe is asking, with no English rivers being rated good for water quality, does water quality affect eel conditions in any way? It's really, that's a really interesting question. And um, actually, one of the very strange things in the Thames, so we, we see a great variation across uh, catchments. So in other words, um, I'll, give, I'll give you an example, the River Brent, uh, some years, we've stopped monitoring it now because we've got so many eels, but the last year we monitored caught about 50,000 eels. The volunteers there were very, very busy. That, that outnumbers anything that we've caught on any, other, any of the other catchments. There seems to be a big um, difference between um, the numbers of eels traveling into different catchments and there's some evidence to, su to suggest that actually the eels are following uh, higher nutrient water bodies. So what we would consider eutrophic polluted water bodies. Um, so the relationship between pollution and eel behavior is not clear. That said, there'll be pollutants which uh, will, be, will be damaging, you know, some of the the reasons why water bodies failed and the latest round of EA data was related to uh, emerging chemicals and other pollutants that we don't know what the relationship is with, with eels. Yeah, thank you. Right, I'm going to squeeze in one more question, I think. Um, we've had a few people asking about this. Are there any sort of pathogens and parasites that affect eels? Yeah, I mentioned one uh, that's a tribute that, that's um, uh, discussed in, in, in the decline uh, of eel recruitment, and that's anguilicoides. That's a, 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 um, a, a fluke that, uh, I think it's a fluke, uh, I should know, um, that accumulates in um, eel swim bladders. So that's a particular parasite that emerged uh, over the last 30 years or so, and it sort of seemed to coincide with the decline. Whether it's a contributory factor, we just don't really know. Uh, but the, like lots of fish, like many fish species, they, they will be, they do carry parasites, fish do carry parasites, but whether they're harmful um, is another matter. Great, thank you. Right, well, sorry everyone, I know there's still lots and lots of questions in the chat, so sorry I didn't get a chance to get through those all. Um, but thank you for joining us this evening and a big thanks to Joe as well for coming and talking to us tonight. It was a great talk and I can tell everyone enjoyed it by all the comments going on in the chat, going crazy in there. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming along and hopefully I'll see you again soon. There's another ZSL talk, as I mentioned, uh, next month on 7th of December. You can book a place on that on our website. But yeah, that's it. Thanks to Joe and bye everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.